let us now open the Word of God. And I wish to read to you Psalm 73. And I read this in connection with the sermon on Lord's Day 1 about the only comfort in life and death. So read together Psalm 73. And then we read the word of the Lord, the psalm of Asaph. Truly, God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But as for me, my feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. For there are no pangs in their death, but their strength is firm. They are not in trouble as other men, nor are they plagued like other men. Therefore pride serves as a necklace. Violence covers them like a garment. Their eyes bulge with abundance. They have more than heart could wish. They scoff and speak wickedly concerning oppression. They speak loftily. They set their mouth against the heavens and their tongue walks through the earth. Therefore his people return here, and waters of a full cup are drained by them. And they say, how does God know? And is there knowledge in the Most High? Behold, these are the ungodly, who are always at ease, they increase in riches. Surely I have cleansed my heart in vain, and washed my hands in innocence. For all day long I've been plagued and chastened every morning. If I had said I will speak thus, behold, I would have been untrue to the generation of your children. When I thought how, I understand, how to understand this, it was too painful for me. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down to destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation, as in a moment. They are utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Thus my heart was grieved, and I was vexed in my mind. I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. For indeed, those who are far from you shall perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. But it is good for me to draw near to God. I have put my trust in the Lord God, that I may declare all your works. Thus far, scripture reading. This afternoon, I wish to preach to you the gospel as we confess that in Lord's Day 1 of the Heidelberg Catechism. We'll read that together, Lord's Day 1, which is page 517 in the Book of Praise. In Lord's Day 1, that the question is asked and answered. What is your only comfort in life and death? that I am not my own, but belong with body and soul, both in life and death, to my faithful Saviour, Jesus Christ. He has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and has set me free from all the power of the devil. He also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work toward my salvation." And therefore, by his Holy Spirit, he assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. 
What do you need to know in order to live and die in the joy of this comfort? First, how great my sins and misery are. Second, how I am delivered from all my sins and misery. And third, how I am to be thankful to God for such deliverance. Beloved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ. Would you in this, on this hot Sunday afternoon not have reason to be jealous of people who do not know and serve the Lord? They can do what they like. They can go out and fully enjoy themselves while you are sitting here in the church building listening to a sermon are often our unbelievers often not better off than us they can do or refuse to do whatever they like while you have to do or you have to refrain from certain things because of your faith being a Christian also costs a lot of time, energy, money. It, for example, restricts you in your business dealings and in the way you make and spend your money. Are the unbelievers, after all, not better off? Well, let's have a look at this. When I preach to you God's word under the theme Jesus Christ is the only lasting comfort. And we'll consider two things. Firstly, everyone needs that covenant, that comfort. And secondly, that comfort is truly unique. The catechism starts with a very personal question. What is your only comfort in life and death? The question assumes that you and I need comfort. If you consider the time when the catechism was written, you can imagine that people looked for comfort. At the time, people were being persecuted because of their faith. Reformed Christians were being burnt at the stake, hung or tortured. And we can imagine that the Heidelberg Catechism with this introductory question and answer on the comfort became a treasured document among Reformed Christians at that time. But we today, we live in a different time. We're not directly being persecuted or tortured. We live in a free country. And many of us are very well off physically and financially. Does it still make sense to speak of our only comfort? Does everyone really need that comfort? We can understand that people who experience sorrow and difficulties need comfort. That's logical. But does it apply to me when I'm healthy, wealthy, happy, Love, the need for comfort is not always immediately clear. Even Asaph in Psalm 73 initially forgot what that comfort was all about. He considered himself to be in need of comfort, but not those prosperous unbelievers. Asaph begins his psalm with the words he had learned about God. Truly, God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. But Asaph was bothered by the apparent contradiction between what he had learned about God and his experience in life. He was envious, he says, of the arrogant 
and disturbed by the prosperity of the wicked. That prosperity seemed to him in direct contradiction to what he had learned about God. He had been told that if you learn to trust in the Lord, and if you were cleansed by his grace, well, then God would be good to you. That he would take care of you and watch over you. But Asaph was finding his own situation to be difficult, discouraging. While the wicked, the ungodly around him seemed to be doing well in all respects. This bothered him so terribly that it created a deep resentment and envy in his heart. His feet had almost slipped, he'd almost stumbled, he'd almost come to the point where he was ready to renounce his faith. In verses 4 to 12, Asaph gives his impression of the ungodly in their seemingly untroubled lives. They don't seem to experience distress or pain. They are well fed, well clothed. Pride is like an ornament in their lives. Their bearing is one of self-assurance and authority. If someone comes in their way, they are quick to retaliate. They gratify their own desires and passions. They boast in their abilities. And they throw their weight around by threats and displays of power. They defy God and treat him as though he doesn't exist. Well, this troubles Asaph. How can it be that those who defy God and man have everything their hearts desire? Yet here am I, washing my hands in innocence, trying to keep my heart clean. But God put me through trials and difficulties every day. I just don't understand. Have you ever felt that way? The comparison hurts us. Many feel that way. They say, What's the use of being a Christian? There is no advantage to it. You read the Bible, you go to church, you seek fellowship with God and with his people. But what happens? Things can go terribly wrong in your life. It's as though nothing good comes from it. Well, beloved, the purpose of the psalm is to encourage you in your struggle of faith by showing you how Asaph overcame it. The big change for Asaph came when he entered the sanctuary. Verse 7, Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I understood their end. That is the end of the wicked. Why did going into the temple change everything for Asaph? Because by going into the temple, he came into the presence of holy God. In the temple, he was confronted with the reality of God, his holiness, but also his mercy. Think of the sacrifices being brought there in the temple. Blood was needed to bring us back into a right relationship with God. The blood of animals pointed to the sinner who deserved death. But it also pointed forward to Christ who would die as our substitute. Coming into the temple therefore reminded Asaph of his sin and misery before God. It also reminded him of God's grace for him, a lost sinner. The sacrifices were not just necessary, but they were also offered for the remission of sins. God wanted to reconcile sinners with himself. And thus Asaph can enter God's presence without being consumed by God's anger. Just think of it. 
standing or coming into the presence of holy God, a sinner, justified by grace. Brothers and sisters, this afternoon, we experienced something similar when we witnessed the baptism of Hallo Bergsma. The baptism reminded us of our sin and guilt before God. Harlow had to be washed, so to speak. She shares our sins and accursedness. But God didn't just remind us of our sin and misery. He also reminded us of his grace. Harlow didn't just need a washing, but she symbolically also received the washing in her baptism. A triune God declared that he wants to wash her with Christ's blood and spirit and again receive her into his fellowship. We sinners may appear before God, before holy God, justified through Christ. Well, beloved, this encounter with holy God in his temple changed Asaph's thinking completely. God opened his eyes to see the big picture, the full reality of God in his wrath and mercy. And thus Asaph began to shift from natural thinking to spiritual thinking. Yes, he had been thinking like a natural man within the limits of this life, considering only the visible things here on earth. And now in the sanctuary, he begins to think from God's point of view. And that's when he starts to understand what his problem was. When you go to church, or read the scriptures, you're not just trying to find something to soothe you, but you're going so that you might have your eyes opened, that you might see things as they really are, and thus begin to understand what life is all about. The trouble with natural thinking is that it centers our attention on ourselves. It makes us slaves of our feelings, our moods, our emotions. And when that happens to you, your range of vision is narrowed down to only those factors that are troubling you. You can't think beyond that. And when our feelings govern us, they always limit us. And that's what was troubling Asaph. When he comes into the sanctuary, into the presence of God, he begins thinking spiritually. Spiritual thinking is centered on God. God is the center of our lives and of the universe. Then you're no longer governed by emotions, but by thoughts relating to God's truths. And then your vision is broadened. And you can see other things besides the things you're experiencing at the moment. Coming into God's presence, exposing yourself to God's truths can change your attitude from natural thinking to spiritual thinking. What did Asaph learn in the sanctuary? He writes, Then I understood their end. That is the end of the wicked. In feeling sorry for himself, he had forgotten the true situation of the wicked. What is their situation? Well, their situation is terrible, foreboding disaster. They live without God and without hope. Do I have reason to envy the prosperity of the wicked? Surely not, 
when I know God as my Redeemer. No matter how trying my situation may be, God is with me. And in in him I receive an eternal inheritance. How could I have been so short-sighted to think that unbelievers are better off than I am? Beloved, after his eyes were opened, Asaph confessed in shame his foolishness. Verse 22, I was so foolish and ignorant. I was like a beast before you. He honestly faced up to what caused him to come to such wrong conclusions. He acknowledged his wrongs. His problem was not caused by the outward circumstances as such, but by his foolish heart. He allowed his feelings to get hold of him to the point that he worked himself up into a frenzy. The moment his feelings were corrected by God's facts, the problem disappeared. He also ignored the fact that God loved him. He began to distrust God when he failed to realize that a father's loving heart is behind every trial of his children. Finally, he realized that he was like an animal reacting instinctively, concerned only about himself. He acknowledges his guilt, bows before God and says, how stupid I was, how ignorant I've been. How like an animal I have been before you. Beloved, are the unbelievers who prosper better off than a child of God who suffers? Are the strong and influential in society who bully the Christians better off than Christians being bullied? No way. Unless they repent, those bullies and their followers are living without God and without hope. And they're heading for an eternal disaster. Listen to what Asaph says about them in the verses 18 to 20. Surely you set them in slippery places. You cast them down in destruction. Oh, how they are brought to desolation at a moment. They're utterly consumed with terrors. As a dream when one awakes, so, Lord, when you awake, you shall despise their image. Their end is not only disastrous. Think of it, forever being separated from the living God in hell. But not only their end is so terrible. Also today, they experience the consequences of a life without God and without hope. God sets them in slippery places. It's a slippery path they're on. Deceiving, fake joy. God gives them over to their own vile lusts and passions. And is their so-called freedom really so wonderful? In reality, they're not free at all. But they're slaves to sin and Satan. Think of the sexual revolution of the last century. Everything became permissible. No limits anymore. Unrestricted sex. Where, when and with whom you want. Did this lead to greater happiness? A better life? A better society? Without God, life 
is chaotic and destructive. Think of the numerous women who are now finally speaking up about the sexual abu abuse that is going on in Hollywood circles and in the entertainment world, even in workplaces. And what about the aggressive homosexual and transgender lobby? This can only result in further destruction and abuse of people's lives. They're on a slippery path. Having rejected God's truth, they have nothing solid to go by anymore. They're in fact, they in fact have nothing firm to hold on to. Outwardly, they may maintain an appearance of happiness. But do you know what lives in their hearts? Unless they repent, they're on the way to eternal destruction. Asaph also mentions that the ungodly are plagued by terrors. Outwardly, they may appear to be calm and at ease. But how many of them are often gripped inside by fear? Fear of failure, fear of sickness, fear of death. And often the most aggressive atheists seem to be the ones who have not come to grips with a Christian past. They've not worked through certain negative experiences and can be filled with hatred against God and Christians. There is no peace in their hearts. Brothers and sisters, it should be clear by now that everyone, yes, everyone, needs that only lasting comfort, Jesus Christ. Asaph needs it, just as much as the arrogant, wicked, need it. Because of our sin and its consequences, everyone needs comfort. For a time, it may seem that you can do without it. But ultimately, every one of us will have to face holy God. Whether we like it or not, we have all sinned and fallen short of your glory. And thus by nature, we're all subject to condemnation. We also have mortal bodies, health and wealth, power and influence here on earth are very vulnerable. They can be taken away from us just like that. Our situation can suddenly change completely. World leaders come and go. And a generation further, most people don't even know about them anymore. They're like a dream that you forget as soon as you wake up. Earthly pleasures and treasures can only give temporary relief. They don't address the fundamental problem of fallen man. Namely, our sin and separation from God. And one day all of us will face death. And then the earthly things we trusted on will prove to be useless. And if we do not have that only comfort, Jesus Christ, we will face eternal death. Beloved, that comfort God offers is truly unique. It applies for life and death. Asaph sings of it in the latter part of his psalm. He discovered it when he entered the temple. With God there is forgiveness. Think of the sacrifices. In New Testament terms, God has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. 
And directly after confessing his stupidity and ignorance before God, Asaph sings, nevertheless, I'm continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. You guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me in glory. Asaph has discovered that God still loves him. That God still holds on to him, supports him. What a wonder of grace. What was it that stopped him from going over the brink? He sees now that it was the hand of God. It was God himself who put into his mind to go to the sanctuary. And thus stopped him and turned him around. God has been holding him with his right hand. And with his word and spirit, God also wishes to guide him for the rest of his life. Guide him safely through the snares and the problems. And afterwards, Asa says, you'll receive me to glory. This is the end of a Christian. With Asa, we've seen the end of the ungodly. And now we see the end of the Christian. It is glory. And this leads Asaph to glorify God with the words, Whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon the earth that I desire besides you. My flesh and my heart fail, but God is the strength of my heart and my portion forever. Yes, brother, sister, can you say, What the psalmist said here? Have you come to the point where you can say, God is a strength of my heart and my portion forever? Whom have I in heaven but you? And there's nothing on earth that I desire besides you. Here is a man who has seen the total adequacy of God. In every situation of life, God is able to supply all you need. No one else can do this. And thus he concludes his psalm, for indeed those who are far from you will perish. You have destroyed all those who desert you for harlotry. But it is good for me to draw near to God I have put my trust in the Lord God that I may declare all your works. Beloved, Asaph confesses the only comfort in life and death. In New Testament terms and the words of our catechism, my only comfort is that I belong both in life and death to my faithful Saviour, Jesus Christ. Think here of Asa's words, God is my portion forever. My beloved is mine, and I am his. And he, Jesus Christ, has fully paid for all my sins with his precious blood and set me free from all the power of the devil. Think of Asa entering the temple and seeing those sacrifices for the remission of sins. What a liberation that was for Asaph, freed from the power of sin and devil. It changed his life completely. And Jesus Christ also preserves me in such a way that without the will of my heavenly Father, not a hair can fall from my head. Indeed, all things must work together for my salvation. Think of Asaph's words, You hold me by my right hand and you will guide me with your counsel and afterward receive me to glory. And therefore by his Holy Spirit, Jesus Christ also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready from now on to live for him. Think of those words again. You will guide me with your counsel and afterwards receive me to glory. 
And Asa's last words, I have put my trust in the Lord God. That I may declare all your works. Brother, sister, can you repeat those words of Asaph and of our catechism? The catechism challenges every one of you with the very personal question, what is your only comfort in life and death? What do you cling to? What, on, on whom or what do you put your trust? Surely not on the fleeting pleasures and treasures of this earth. No, look on Jesus Christ alone. He has addressed the fundamental problem of mankind. Our sin and separation from God. He has paid the price so that we may live. Live with God and enjoy Him forever. Accept that gospel in faith and repentance. What a joy that will bring in good days and bad for time and eternity.